Philippine tribal tattoos became moderately popular in the USA during the first decade of the 21st century through movements like the Tatak ng Apat na Alon, Mark of the Four Waves. But when you're in the Philippines yourself, chances are you won't see any of them. So let's go and give them a closer look. Just a heads up, in 2013 I wrote a brief German Wikipedia article on this and never got the chance to translate it into English. So if you speak German, you'll basically find the same info here once again. So let's get started. Filipino tribal tattoos are a tradition reaching far back into the region's pre-colonial era for which especially the headhunting tribes in the Cordilleras in northern Luzon are known for, at least in the Philippine context. Most of the time, the tattoos show geometric shapes like lines or circles, scales or celestial objects. And aside from tattoos, some regions also had scarifications. In that sense, the Philippines aren't unique as we'll find the same traditions in Palau as well as Sumatra, Indonesia and other nearby regions. Part 1. Historical Examples When we go back to the very early documents left to us by the Spanish, we will find that when Miguel López de Legazpi met with Raja Sulaiman, in some sources also known as Soliman, in early May 1570, the Raja was keen on pointing out that the people in the Manila area were in fact not pintados like the people in the Visayas. Pintado being Spanish for painted one. This is what the Spanish called the tattooed natives of the Philippines. So tribal tattoos are not a general Philippine tradition, but rather something that some ethnic groups engaged in and others not. Another famous early example of Philippine tribal tattoos is Prince Jolo of Moangis, sometimes spelled Joli and Meangis, also known as the Philippine Prince. He was William Dampier's slave and brought to London and Oxford in 1691, where he was subsequently put on display as an attraction to the people. And even though Dampier promised Jolo to one day return with him to his home country and open trade relations with their kingdom, the slave contracted the smallpox shortly after arriving in Europe and died in 1692. Now, nobody actually knows where Moangis is supposed to be, but speculations range from Sarangani province in the Philippines to the Micronesian state of Yap, as well as the Celebes Sea. The flyer to the Giolo Freak Show actually reads, Prince Giolo, son of Yi King of Muangis of Jilolo, lying under the equator in the longitude of 152 degrees 30 minutes, a fruitful island abounding with rich spices and other valuable commodities. This famous painted prince is the just wonder of Yi age. His whole body except face, hands and feet is curiously and most exquisitely painted or stained full of variety and invention with prodigious art and skill performed. In so much of the ancient and noble mystery of painting or staining upon human bodies seems to be comprised in this one stately piece. The more admirable back parts afford us a representation of one quarter part of the sphere upon and betwixt his shoulders where ye arctic and tropic circles center in ye north pole of his neck. The paint itself is so durable which nothing can wash it off or deface ye beauty of it. It is prepared from ye juice of a certain herb or plant peculiar to that country which they esteem infallible to preserve human bodies from ye deadly poison or hurt of any venomous creature whatsoever. And none but those of ye royal family are permitted to be thus painted with it. This admirable person is about ye age of 30, graceful and well proportioned in all his limbs, extremely modest and civil, neat and cleanly, but his language is not understood, neither can he speak English. Although the drawings on the flyer itself are more artistic interpretation and not accurate, the ad certainly gives us a rough impression of what those tattoos were perceived as by Europeans back in the day. So let's take a closer look at those tattoos themselves, shall we? Part 2. Terminology Nowadays, when we talk about tattoos in Tagalog, we normally use words like tato or tattoo for them. But going back in time, we also have terms like batik, which depending on transliteration and dialect, can also be spelled batik, patok, barok, and so on. My personal hypothesis is that it's a cognate to the Malay batik, which means coloring. If you're from the West, you probably heard that word when you were dyeing t-shirts during summer camp at some point. Anyway. According to Salvador Amores in 2002, the morpheme tic, sometimes also spelled tek or tok, is an onomatopoetic term derived from the sound the tattoo tool makes when being hit on to penetrate the skin. And since all Austronesian languages like Tagalog are agglutinating, 
The tattoo artists in the Philippines used to be called terms like Mambatek, Mambabarok, Pambabatok, depending on the region. All of them literally meaning person who tattoos. Now, aside from those tattoos, we also had scarifications, which the Akta, also known as Aeta, engage in. Unlike tattoos, you are not coloring the skin but creating decorative designs by wounding the client's skin. Among the Akta, this tradition is called tuktuk and is done by using tinder to ignite a person's skin. Done correctly, one gets these very decorative designs that you can see here. Aside from this, the Akta also have the tradition of tayat, in which the incisor, canine and premolar teeth of young boys are ruptured, cut and sharpened to look like predator teeth after their baby teeth fall out. The biggest difference between this tribal tattooing tradition and western tattoos is that these are not merely decorative but have to be earned. For the Kalinga for example, a true warrior culture, boys and men earn tattoos by killing their opponents and taking their heads. In other instances, young mothers get tattoos after giving birth. And when getting tattoos, the recipient won't have narcotica on them. So the tradition of tattoos is a bit different from the west where tattoos are primarily meant to look good or serve as a means to self-express. Instead, they serve not only as one's biography, but also as a demonstration of one's societal status. Depending on your region, the tattoo stick can be called batik, while the instrument is called gisi. A straw is then bent and used as a stencil to imprint the ink. The needle used for tattooing is traditionally a thorn gained from a kalamansi shrub, which is pierced through a bamboo stick to make the batik. The ink itself is made out of soot and water. Part 3. Modern Context So all of this is fine and dandy and when I was little and we went to Banawe, we could still see lots of people with tribal tattoos, albeit primarily older folk. But nowadays it's become quite a rare sight. So what happened? While the Spanish primarily stayed within some coastal cities during the overwhelming majority of their colonial period, FYI, this is why tribal societies were able to make it way up to the end of the 20th century in the Philippines and why Spanish was never able to overtake any endemic language. Uh, the Spanish were only forced to engage more with the Philippines when Mexico declared independence. Um, but anyway, the USA had a much more aggressive form of colonialism. They set out with the intent to civilize the savage under the banner of the white man's burden and replace endemic culture with an alien American one a policy that in hindsight had terrible consequences for the locals. Another reason for the decline on tattoos is the Catholic Church and their stance on tattoos. Within the Christian churches in the Philippines, tattoos are frowned upon by some priests who use Leviticus 19.28 as an argument against them. You shall not make any cuts on your body for the dead or tattoo yourselves. I am the Lord. For non-Christian Filipino-Chinese, the Xiaojing also prohibits tattoos as it states our bodies from our hair to our skin comes from our parents thus we cannot injure them. This is the beginning of filial piety. So all in all, it doesn't look too good for tribal tattoos in that general context and outside of the mainstream religious philosophical realm. Uh, one also frequently hears in the Philippines that future employers will not want tattooed employees, which means that this tradition is driven further and further into extinction. In that sense, it might be a gift that some Americans decided to engage in this in search for their Filipino identity. Thanks for listening.